At the dawn of the 20th century, the future of aviation is in the hands of a few visionaries and daredevils. In 1903, American brothers Wilbur and Orville Wright make four flights of a few dozen meters on a North Carolina beach. In 1909, Louis Blériot successfully flies across the English Channel, showing the world that an aeroplane can have a use other than aerobatics. Then, in 1913, Roland Garros takes off from San Rafael in his monoplane and makes it to Bizert in Tunisia in 7 hours and 53 minutes, the first crossing of the Mediterranean. The age of the pioneers ends suddenly in 1914 with the outbreak of the First World War. This will revolutionize the aeronautical industry and introduce new heroes. In August 1914, France, Russia and the British Empire are at war with the German and Austro-Hungarian empires. Germany has invaded Belgium, Luxembourg and northern France. Military aviation barely even exists in France, with a mere 130 aircraft in the whole country. The face of aviation is a hodgepodge of colours, shapes and sizes. The first warplanes are no more than civilian planes painted in military colours. Germany has 320 aircraft, of which fewer than half are in any fit state to fly. The Germans put their faith in Zeppelins, which are capable of covering thousands of kilometers and carrying up to nine tons of bombs. The insular British soon realize the potential of military aviation and are the first to create an autonomous aerial force, the Royal Flying Corps. Unfortunately, they only have around 40 aircraft. The exploits of civilian airmen are thrilling young people, and the war presents an opportunity for many adventurous youths who want to become pilots, and many are ready to chance their arm. Georges Guinemer is 20 years old. Five recruitment officers have declared him unfit for the army. This is no deterrent. His father tries to enroll him into the future Air Force. On m'a dit que pour vous les aviateurs étaient des embusqués. Oh, J'étais dans l'infanterie. J'aurais voulu qu'il lui fasse ses armes, mais il veut rien entendre. Il veut voler. Voler, c'est bien joli, mais que voulez-vous qu'on fasse de lui si physiquement c'est une cloche Alors quoi Vous ne voulez pas de l'infanterie comme votre père Il le croit incapable de marcher 40 km par jour. Mais il se trompe. Même si c'est un fil de fer monté en graines. Il est doué en sport. Au fleuret, au tennis. Vous connaissez la mécanique Vous avez bien quelques notions. Mais il a suivi de hautes études. Il a même failli intégrer Polytechnique. C'est bien simple, il sait tout faire. Même conduire ma voiture. Dans ce cas, je vais vous prendre le service auxiliaire. Vous serez élève mécanicien. Pourquoi faire tu aideras les pilotes à enfourcher leurs appareils, petit. Tu n'auras jamais à te servir d'une arme. Mais qu'est-ce que vous croyez Que je suis une poule mouillée Je n'ai pas dit ça. Hein il veut se battre. Depuis le premier jour, il veut s'engager. Très bien. Je vais téléphoner au commandant. Lui dire qu'on a un nouveau volontaire. Merci. Ah Et... Il se procure une salopette et se salisse un peu les mains. Histoire de faire illusion. Bon. Ben C'est un début. At the start of the war in 1914, Guinemer is 20 years old. His father is an officer who has retired to live on his pension. His mother, a distant descendant of the French royal family. At boarding school, Georges Guinemer is a reasonably good student, but as people would say today, rather rebellious. Throughout his adolescence, Georges Guinemer was an excited follower of the daring do of the heroes of civil aviation. 
men like Louis Blériot, Jules Vedrin, and Roland Garros. Their exploits enthralled the general public. But military aviation was still a pipe dream. The chiefs of staff took a dim view of these flying machines, considering them too flimsy to be of any use. One has to remember that none of the nations wanted to, or even knew how, to fight a war from the air. Mostly the generals were not over enamored with this machinery. It was a young man's fancy. Uh, they didn't believe that the airplanes would stay in the air that long. And as one general famously remarked, how can these young chaps see what's happening on the ground? When they're in the air, the, the ground must be just a blur. There was no question of using a plane to fight. They could barely carry the weight of their pilots because their engines weren't powerful enough. A group of young French pilots convinced the chiefs of staff to equip their aircraft with cameras. This marks the birth of aerial reconnaissance, and the army very quickly realizes the strategic importance of this. In September 1914, the aircraft took off from an airfield near Paris. One of them was piloted by Louis Breguet. This was the moment when people realized how important aerial observation would be. He saw the German army, whom no one had suspected of being so close to Paris. And this would trigger the first Battle of the Marne. Marshal Joffre knows how to make use of this intelligence in a counterattack which unites the French and British against the Germans in a great battle. Known as the Battle of the Marne, it is the first great Allied victory of World War I. No one had imagined that in the wake of the Battle of the Marne, there would be such a great need for aeroplanes. German industry was not up to the job of responding quickly enough. It was also nigh on impossible to train enough competent pilots to make up for those already lost. Developing an air force becomes a priority for both sides, but there is a shortage of everything. They will have to train the ground crews, the mechanics, and the pilots. There is a paucity of basic materials. France has lost 75% of its coal fields, 63% of its iron production, 81% of its cast iron, 90% of its brass, and all of its iron deposits in Lorraine. It is an industrial catastrophe. The French government will work alongside the constructors by paying over the odds in order to get the best of their technical know-how, unlike what is going on in Germany, where factories are being requisitioned. The Germans are one step ahead of the French and are already making advances with fighter aircraft. Excusez-moi, êtes-vous bien le lieutenant Bulk Je tenais à vous dire vos victoires sur la ligne de cœur. Extraordinaire. Vous avez sûrement un secret. Mon secret C'est très simple. Je m'approche le plus près possible de mon adversaire. Je vise et il tombe, naturellement. Avec moi, ce n'est pas aussi efficace. Loin de là. Mais je ne suis qu'un observateur. Je dépends de mon pilote. Il fait toujours n'importe quoi. C'est peut-être vous qui tirez n'importe comment. Devenez pilote, seul maître à bord. Il n'y aura ainsi que vous à blâmer. C'est bien mon intention. Devenir pilote. Le premier des chasseurs. Et il a un nom, le premier des chasseurs Manfred von Richthofen. L'an dernier, il était encore officier de cavalerie. Mais vous avez déjà essayé de faire des reconnaissances à cheval au milieu des barbelés et des tranchées Nous avons tous été reversés dans l'infanterie. Et là, j'ai passé mon temps à tirer le sanglier. Alors j'ai écrit à mon supérieur. Je lui ai dit, chère excellence, je ne suis pas parti à la guerre pour rassembler œufs et fromage. Vous vous vantez. Vous n'avez pas pu écrire cela à un supérieur. Pourquoi cela Parce que je suis un Prussien bien élevé, issu d'une bonne famille Je l'ai écrit, Air Robert Lieutenant, et j'ai obtenu mon transfert dans l'aviation. In 1915, Manfred von Richthofen is 23 years old. The future Red Baron is of aristocratic descent. Tradition dictates he should be a cavalryman, 
but he has decided to take to the skies. Von Richthofen's meeting with the German ace Bölker inspires the future Red Baron to become the best pilot ever. Oswald Bölker was considered Germany's master fighter pilot. He had developed and taught rules for aerial combat. He made demonstration flights and was very successful. His human qualities made him an exemplary leader. Richthofen will soon realize that riding a horse is easier than flying an aeroplane. Il va nous en casser combien d'appareils, l'Aristo Il aurait mieux fait de rester observateur. Hein. Non, mais il n'aura jamais son brevet. Ouais. C'est pas gagné. Hein. Un petit verre à la santé de Richthofen Oh Richthofen J'ai fait toutes les manœuvres correctement. <rire> C'est juste l'engin qui n'a pas réagi comme d'habitude. <rire> ah ouais, évidemment, c'est la faute du constructeur. Hein. Pas de fierté mal placée. Vous avez juste eu la trouille. Ça n'a rien à voir avec la trouille. Mais si. Quand on a peur, on devient maladroit. Incapable de maîtriser l'équilibre de l'avion, de raisonner clairement. Puis après, tout s'enchaîne. On fait une fausse manœuvre. On pique de la tête et on casse du bois. Vous parlez d'expérience Bon, ça suffit. Calmez-vous. On a tous eu la trouille ici. Alors toujours que c'est indigne d'un défenseur de la patrie, mais au contraire. Décoller malgré tout, c'est ça le courage. Je vous ai observé là-haut. Pour un premier volant solitaire, après seulement 24 heures d'instruction, à part l'atterrissage, c'était pas mal du tout. Croyez-moi, Manfred sera bientôt le meilleur d'entre nous. Le premier des chasseurs. Hmm Allez. In the French camp, after repeated blandishments and pleas, Guinemer finally receives permission to learn to fly, thanks to the goodwill of Captain Bernard Thierry, who adds him to the new list of student pilots. One month later, Georges Guinemer makes his maiden flight and receives his military diploma, but he is clumsy and damages several machines. It's thought that he will end up killing himself, or worse still, his observer or his comrades on the ground. Guinemer and Richthofen are not the only ones to experience a difficult start. The German Ernst Udet is just 19 when he arrives at the base at Saint-Quentin. We know that his application to enlist was turned down. Udet was just 1.6 meters tall. He didn't come from a noble or privileged family. He ended up being a volunteer motorcyclist behind the front, a role which did not suit him in the slightest. He was trained by his own officer and applied once again to the Air Force, and this time was successful. After a bombing raid, Udet crashes. He spends 14 days in hospital at the end of which he's ready to try again. Caporal, ne me faites pas croire que vous avez l'intention de revoler. Bien sûr que si, mon capitaine. Je suis complètement rétabli. Et regardez-le. Il croit vraiment qu'on va lui redonner sa chance. Mais son inconscience a coûté à la patrie une excellente machine neuve et a failli tuer son observateur. Ils me regardaient tous comme si j'avais commis un parricide. Écoutez-moi. 
le caporal Oudet, qui s'est rendu coupable de vol en courbe, mettant en péril la vie de son observateur et causant la perte d'une machine en parfait état, est puni. Il sera aux arrêts pour sept jours. Veuillez vous présenter de ce pas aux autorités policières. Nous ne voulons plus vous revoir sur un terrain d'aviation. Que cela vous serve d'avertissement à tous. D'accord, j'ai volé en courbe. Oui, c'est interdit. Mais cette interdiction, c'est l'invention de bureaucrates qui n'ont jamais piloté. Vous pouvez pas m'envoyer. On me punissait injustement. Et je pensais à mes parents. Mon père était si fier que je sois pilote. Qu'allais-je lui raconter Qu'on me jetait en prison et qu'on me renvoyait comme inutilisable Since the previous winter, the war has intensified. And the chiefs of staff of the two enemy forces have started to realize that this is becoming a war of attrition. The French army has put in an order for 500 aircraft. But very soon there are difficulties. The constructors realize that in a year they will only be able to build 167 of the 500 machines requested. At the time, there are only two kinds of engine. The inline engine used in the car industry and the rotary engine used in aviation. The latter has two major drawbacks. It's difficult to assemble and there are very few workshops in France capable of building it. Conversely, inline engines are quick and simple to make and are built in dozens of workshops throughout the country. Unfortunately, these inline engines are also very heavy. At this point in the war, the best solution for the aircraft is to use the much lighter rotary engine. Four models of aircraft are eventually retained by the French Army. The Farman 7 for reconnaissance, the Caudron G3 for artillery directing and observation, the Moran Saulnier Parasol for dogfighting, and the Voisin LA-5 for bombing. At this point in time, France is master of the skies. Two-seater planes are still the most common and widespread. If there is a pilot who is predicted to have an illustrious future from day one, it's Paul René Fonck, who comes from the Vosges. He is a working-class lad who hasn't been rejected like the others, but is called up to serve his country at the beginning of the war. He's 20 years old. From a humble background, he sees his enlistment into the army as an opportunity to advance his career swiftly. He starts off, as all pilots at that time, as an observer. Fonk is not the most outgoing of people. He's quite reserved. I would say he's quite calculating, and in his lifestyle is very aesthetic, which makes him different to a lot of his comrades. He's been an orphan from the age of five and has been brought up with the spirit of revenge for the 1870 war. On me cantonnait, hélas, à des missions de reconnaissance. Je sortais matin et soir, tantôt sur le versant alsacien, tantôt sur le versant français. Je réglais des tirs d'artillerie sur les batteries et les tranchées ennemies. Mais au fond de moi survivait toujours l'espoir de voir apparaître un avion ennemi à l'horizon, afin d'en découdre avec lui. From the beginning of 1915, the war has extended geographically inexorably towards the Eastern Fronts, before stabilizing without either side having claimed a significant victory. In France, as in Germany, the aeronautical industry has moved on apace. Arming their aircraft has become the focus of their research and trials. In the early days of the war, the weapons carried were not at all adapted to the aircraft's mission. Pilots carried anything to defend themselves with, such as rifles, pistols, and even bricks that they would throw at their opponent. But there were no specially commissioned weapons. They mainly throw fléchettes, which are steel darts that look like pencils with flights on. They are thrown in bundles of 100 or 500. The whistling sound they make is extraordinary and very scary. It is said that they can go through a cavalryman and his horse. 
Having said that, they're ineffective, although quite dangerous, but the effect is more psychological than anything else. It very soon becomes evident that the weaponry should be firmly fixed, pointing in the direction the plane is flying to achieve maximum efficiency. But the propeller is a problem. Roland Garros tests a new prototype which trials an automatic rifle fixed to the front, with armor plating at the back of the propeller to protect it from any bullets that might ricochet off it. This forward firing proves to be a fearsome weapon. Roland Garros shoots down three enemies in two weeks, the first victories to be achieved by a man flying solo at the controls of a one-seater. He becomes a war hero. But Garros, in the wake of his last victory, has to make an emergency landing and his plane is seized by the Germans, in spite of his attempt to set it on fire. At the same time, Guinemer is sent to perfect his skills with the MS-3 Stork Squadron at Vosienne, under the orders of Commander Brocard. He has no sooner arrived than he wrecks another two planes. Get rid of the little fool, Brocard tells Védrine. The venerated pilot Védrine chooses to defend the youngster, promising he will soon prove himself. Védrine, who was Guinemer's boyhood hero, becomes his mentor. Guinemer is ecstatic. From then on, everything changes. That morning, Guinemer requests authorization to make a flight, accompanied only by his mechanic, Gerda. Attention, Caporal. Tu ne l'abîmes pas? Tu n'as pas confiance? À force de te regarder travailler, je le connais, l'engin. Tu peux démonter un carbu, régler une soupape. Souder un conduit d'essence? Parfaitement. D'accord. Mais pas aussi parfaitement que moi. T'as pas mieux comme brodequin Hein Pourquoi Mais c'est pas une tenue pour voler. Euh, voler Maintenant. On prend le coucou et on décolle. Juste toi et moi. Mais t'as... L'autorisation Oui. Bon Bah juste le temps d'enfiler et autre chose que c'est... T'es bien avec Ah ouais Alors garde-les. On n'a pas de temps à perdre. La mitrailleuse, elle est chargée au moins. Je vais tout vérifier. Faudrait mieux. Parce qu'on sait pas ce qui nous attend là-haut. Des plaies et des boches. Allez, on y va. As a journalist wrote, the aircraft would become his friend, the best he had, an extension of himself. Je suis prêt. This plaything enables him to soar away from the Earth. The sky is his new world, a perfect world. Flying at this time is highly dangerous. To find the courage to take off or engage in combat, airmen have to learn to forget the extreme fragility of the machines. Certains me prennent encore pour un blanc bec sans expérience. Et je leur prouverai que je suis solide. Hier, avec Gerder, nous avons installé un nouveau trépied destiné à supporter notre mitrailleuse. En espérant qu'elle ne s'en aille pas. J'espère croiser un Allemand et le transformer en écumoire. A German fighter suddenly bursts out of the sun.
His first battle, his first victory, and a first military medal for Guinemer, who will become known as the Iron Kid. His mechanic will also be decorated. These are the young chaps who are going to win the war for us, their officer cries. Two days after Guinemer's first victory, on the 21st of July, 1915, Paul René Fonck finally has his first taste of combat. But his opponent manages to escape. His first kill will have to wait. Little does he know that for him, success will be a long time coming. The war has been raging on for 12 months. While at the beginning of the conflict, the great European powers were the only ones involved, alliances and the desire to control other nations' colonies have made this into a global conflict. The Turks have the Suez Canal in their sights. The British are defending their interests in Mesopotamia. Bulgaria and Albania are involved in the conflict in Serbia. The Russians attack Hungary, while the Italians attack the Austrians at Isonzo. In southwestern Africa, the Germans are being attacked by South African and Rhodesian troops. The sky may only be a secondary theater of operations, but the French and the Germans are in desperate need of aviators. Corporal Udet is requisitioned for a bombing mission over Belfort. He had thought he was permanently banned from flying, and now he is being asked to return to active service. The Germans, having seized the aeroplane flown by Roland Garros, are hoping it will inspire them to perfect their own equipment. The Dutch engineer, Anthony Fokker, who works for them, has developed a machine gun which works in synchronization with the propellers. He's equipped the new engines with these guns, and the Fokker series is born. It will become the Allies' worst nightmare. The German pilots will finally be able to avenge their defeat at the Marne. It's around this time that Manfred von Richthofen, whose training flights have ended up making quite an impression, is awarded his pilot's badge. In February 1916, the interminable Battle of Verdun begins. Verdun is the biggest battle in the history of warfare. It begins on the 21st of February 1916. The French have virtually no squadrons with which to oppose the well-organized Germans. Verdun was one of the first examples of the strategy of grouping of armed forces. There was a concentration of aircraft, which was supposed to support the attacking ground forces. It's a big problem for us, because they not only go after our observation planes, but the fighters too. The few fighters we have are getting caught by groups of aircraft. The first pitched battles take place in the skies over Verdun. And so thousands of shells rain down on the north and northeast sides of Verdun, which very soon creates the landscape which you see in the photographs taken at the time. This lunar landscape, where you can lose your bearings, where infantrymen do lose their bearings. But these lost bearings are not just a problem for the infantry, but also for the airmen. Because every few hours the destroyed landscape would change, and so pilots can no longer rely on the information they have gathered beforehand. Whilst the Germans dominate the skies, some young French pilots are not afraid to fly despite the high risks. Fighting far from Verdun, in the Somme, Guinemer, a perfectionist, leaves nothing to chance. He hones his style and his technique, which consists of swooping down out of the sun, and he starts racking up the victories. 
Behind the controls of his machine sits the tortured soul who once slapped a school teacher who had called him the smallest kid in the class. Le sale gosse que je suis a encore fait des siennes. J'ai vengé un de mes camarades qui a été descendu hier. Pas une balle dans mon appareil. Je n'ai pas perdu ma veine. It's incredible. Flying at over 100 kilometers an hour, can you imagine the pilot holding the joystick with his knees? Getting up and removing the empty magazine, replacing it with a full one and then taking back control? While he does this, he is obviously at the mercy of his opponent. So he generally flies away from the battle zone to complete this maneuver. Alongside the bombing, dogfighting would initially develop with the aim of countering observation and artillery adjustment. But of course, you can see a knock-on effect. The hunters become the hunted. As we try to protect our air force, including our fighter aircraft. So aerial combat became an activity in its own right. This tragedy, which has already killed nearly a million people in two years, causes the public to become attached to the pilots. Each of their exploits shines like a beacon of hope in the darkness. It's decided to keep account of their victories in the form of kill tallies. In France, you need five confirmed victories to become an ace. And for a victory to be recorded, the enemy aircraft has to be brought down in front of two French witnesses, and it has to fall behind French lines. Otherwise, it's a probable kill. In Germany, a victory had to be confirmed by at least two witnesses. Ideally, the aircraft would have fallen on the right side of enemy lines, and the victory would then be validated. The English rely on a man's word of honor. That means that if two English airmen attack the same enemy, they can both claim a victory. However, this can make things awkward when victories are counted in relation to planes shot down. A French reconnaissance plane escorted by four fighters is about to have a tragic encounter and discover the Germans' latest fighter plane, the Fokker D2. It's the first aircraft equipped with synchronized machine guns. Ernst Udet sees that for the first time he could grab his chance. Outnumbered five to one, the young German pilot flies into battle with the fearless folly of youth. Following his master Oswald Böcker's instructions, he swoops down on his enemy. À 80 mètres, je dois commencer à tirer. Mais je ne dois le faire qu'à coup sûr. Plus près. Encore plus près. Cinquante mètres. Quarante. Trente. Feu. Sur le moment, je n'ai pas l'impression que ce sont des hommes qui meurent. C'est dur, c'est cruel, mais c'est l'impitoyable réalité de la guerre. On the 18th of March 1916, Ernst Udet finally records his own first confirmed victory. The chivalrous aspect of these aerial duels has often been highlighted by literature, film, and the media. But was it based on reality? There's a lot of talk about uh, chivalry in the First War. By and large, this was rubbish. Um, they were out to kill the opposition. And it didn't, um, didn't really matter how they did that, providing they, they got, got away from the front. There's no use waving goodbye to a guy because you think his guns are empty, uh, because he may come back the next day and either kill you or kill your best mate. So if you can kill him, you kill him.
Today, Fonk has finally recorded his first official victory two years after he flew for the first time. Two avions, two rumplers, who arrive face à moi. I was thinking to all those who were watching since the trenches. It didn't have to be that I didn't let them. It didn't have to be anything else, but my appareil was inferior. So I tried to repair the most froussard. He was the one who would have the most. And I went straight on him. Je voulais le forcer à atterrir chez nous. Et de virage en virage, et de spirale en spirale, on a descendu 4000 mètres d'altitude et je l'ai forcé à atterrir dans une prairie. Ils n'en pouvaient plus, les deux boches. Et ils sont rendus depuis les trois. Kill or be killed. More and more pilots find themselves driven by hatred. Among them is the British pilot Edward Manock. Born in Ireland, Edward Manock grew up in a typically poor district in Victorian England. Early in the war, while working as a telephone engineer in Turkey, he is taken prisoner. His health having deteriorated behind their bars, the Turks, who were allies of the Germans, decided that this sickly man who is virtually half blind due to a childhood illness is of no military use. When they send him home, they never imagine that what they are in fact liberating is a future hero of the skies. Second lieutenant Manox, sir. I have a rendezvous. Repos. Bien. Mettez-vous torse nu. Determined to become a pilot, he knows that the catastrophically bad vision in his left eye is a handicap he will have to overcome. Encore. Vue, comment est-elle Bien, très bien. Retournez-vous. Et couvrez-vous. Couvrez-vous l'œil droit. Le droit, j'ai dit. Lisez. M-R-T-V-F-U-E-N-C-X-O-Z-T. Votre dernier T, en fait, c'était un D. Mais à part ça, c'était parfait. Vous pouvez vous habiller. En plus, on a besoin de gens comme vous. On the 14th of August 1916, Edward Manock is admitted to the military flying school in Reading. 1916 is the year during which the British Air Force proves itself, thanks to its pilots and its new squadrons. The aviator William Leaf Robinson shows the way by flying to a height of more than 11,000 feet and attacking an airship, causing an explosion that is seen from 150 kilometers away. Autumn 1916 marks the beginning of England's pilots' ability to defend their country. At certain times, the Allies have the technological advantage, and at other times, the Germans can claim aerial superiority. And during these periods, the respective nations' air races cover themselves in glory. The aces have become larger than life in a way. And many of them, when they are walking around town, for example, when they were on leave, get recognized. And there's a certain admiration. Let's not forget that these are young men who are between 20 and 25 years old. When they start to become famous, naturally a kind of court forms around them, which they are certainly not immune to. And occasionally, a rising star of the stage meets a fellow star from the sky. Au revoir, très cher. Merci, merci. Yvonne Printemps, who made her debut aged 14 at the Folie Bergère and the Cigale in roles which were rather saucy, had been noticed by Sacha Guitry. He had fallen madly in love with her and had started writing plays for her. Je vous prie de m'excuser, on m'a dit que je pouvais. M'attendre ici. J'y tenais même. Quand on m'a dit que le lieutenant Guinmer était dans la salle. Enfin. Vous en avez pensé quoi de la pièce J'ai beaucoup aimé, oui. Vous et Sacha, ensemble, c'est. Moi et Bonbon Ce n'est que du théâtre, vous savez. Je suis sa maîtresse sur scène uniquement. <rire> je perds la tête, faut pas m'en vouloir. C'est pas tous les jours que l'as des as vient m'applaudir et. Et me rendre visite dans ma loge. L'as des as Appelez-moi plutôt Georges. Mais vous êtes un héros. Chacune de vos 35 victoires, c'est une nouvelle petite victoire de la Marne. C'est pas Morten qui a écrit ça Légion d'honneur, croix de guerre. Faudrait pas que ça vous gêne. 
Je sais pas. Et modeste avec ça C'est tout de même pour vous qu'on construit de nouveaux avions. Comment il s'appelle, le... Le SPAD. Ouais. Dites donc, avec tout ça, où est-ce qu'on va Comment ça Chez Maxime, ça vous dit Vous connaissez Avec plaisir. The two youngsters soon become France's most glamorous couple. They almost make people forget the war. In the skies over Verdun, French air power, which had been numerically crushed early on, is back on top form. The Battle of Verdun marks a decisive stage, demonstrating that aerial superiority is an essential corollary to ground warfare. France goes from having 10 to 111 squadrons, and from having 130 aircraft to over 1,100 at the front. Thanks to Guinemer, Nungesser, and a host of other pilots, the Allies reconquer the sky over Verdun. They inflict such heavy losses on their enemies that the German High Command has no choice but to find a riposte. Yasta 2, the squadron commanded by Oswald Bölke, has just taken off for its fifth mission of the day. Their objective is to engage with British reconnaissance aircraft, which they have identified near the front. C'est sous les ordres de Bölke que j'ai remporté ma première victoire, un mois auparavant. C'est lui qui m'a tout appris. Ce qu'il dit est sacré. Et à chaque engagement, je respecte scrupuleusement ses consignes. S'assurer toujours une position avantageuse avant l'attaque. Grimper avant l'approche afin de surprendre l'ennemi d'une altitude supérieure. Piquer rapidement sur son arrière au moment de l'attaque. Pas tirer avant que l'ennemi ne soit à bonne portée et parfaitement encadré par le viseur. Si l'adversaire semble touché, le suivre jusqu'au sol pour être sûr de sa destruction. Whilst in the midst of an attacking maneuver, Bölker is hit by fire from one of his own squadron's planes. Immediately, Richthofen turns from his target and begins to spiral around his leader, anxiously following his efforts to save his damaged aeroplane. His spine fractured, Oswald Bölke is killed outright. C'est moi que l'on désigna pour représenter son escadrille et porter ses décorations à son enterrement à la cathédrale de Cambrai. Ce malheur me toucha comme la perte d'un grand frère chéri. Seething with a spirit of revenge, Richthofen marks up two further kills, highlighted in the propaganda press. He has a habit, as soon as a plane has been shot down, of landing quickly and jumping in a car, so that he can go and examine the damage he has caused. Like a hunter, he uses a knife to cut away a piece of tailplane canvas to send to his mother, who will hang the trophy on his bedroom wall. But in the Somme at Verdun, on the eastern fronts, aerial combat is also managing to make its own imprint on the war. 
These Knights of the Sky enjoyed a level of prestige far greater than that of other soldiers, whose daily grind consists of crawling through the mud of the trenches. Every day across all fronts, 5,000 soldiers meet their death. The slaughter of the first two years of the war takes on a magnitude never previously seen at this point in the early 20th century. Regardez, Capitaine, l'escadrille des cigognes. Halte là Toudou, on vient d'être relevé des lignes. Et mes hommes aimeraient voir Guinemer s'il est là. C'est son avion, là, le vieux Charles. Lieutenant Guinemer, on vous a vu hier. Vous avez survolé notre tranchée, ça nous a fait chaud au cœur. Baissez votre arme. En rang, messieurs Garde à vous Je ne veux pas vous salir les mains. Pensez-vous. Quand j'ai débuté, mon capitaine trouvait que j'avais les mains trop propres. Vous êtes un dieu pour nous. Un dieu qui culmine à 1m70. N'empêche, avec vous, on se sent protégés, pas abandonnés. Les jours où on ne voit pas d'avion, on se sent comme des enfants qui n'ont pas eu de dessert. Vous savez, on fait ce qu'on peut pour ralentir les boches, repérer leurs mitrailleuses et vous dire si elles ont été détruites ou pas. Fighters in the air and on land, hand in hand, like brothers in arms. The Battle of the Somme resulted in more than one million casualties. The Battle of Verdun claimed over 700,000 victims in 10 months. Conditions for the soldiers were inhumane. For the French soldiers, they were a tonic. The soldiers lauded them because they helped them in battle. They saw it like this. When a plane bearing their insignia won a battle, the soldiers would celebrate wildly. I think the majority of the guys on the ground wouldn't have put themselves in an airplane for love nor money. And they saw this as a very dangerous occupation because they went over the top. Over the top means the soldiers go over the top of the trenches and charge into the machine guns. But that was only every now and again, perhaps every two months or more sometimes. These flying guys were over the top every day, fighting every day, going down in flames every day. Idolized, seen as demigods, the airmen were in fact mere mortals, terribly exposed. On the 23rd of November, 1916, Richthofen fights and wins a terrible duel with the great British air race Lenoe Hawker. He doesn't change his habits, landing near his victim and claiming a souvenir. Cher maman, mon combat contre cet Anglais a été le plus terrible de ceux que j'ai livrés jusqu'à ce jour. Arrivé à 1000 mètres d'altitude, il me fit un petit signe amical. Mais j'ai fini par l'atteindre d'une balle en pleine tête. Il s'écrasa dans nos lignes, sa mitrailleuse s'enfonça dans le sol. Elle orne maintenant le mur de ma chambre. 1916 comes to an end. Richthofen and Guinemer will soon have to contend with a new generation of pilots. Funk, Udet, Manuk as well as Americans, Canadians, Belgians, Italians, and Russians. Aerial warfare and the aeronautical industry will, at the same time, also enter a new era. <laughs> 